Good afternoon and welcome to this IIEA webinar on Afghanistan at the cro Crossroads. This is part of the IIEA's Global Europe Project and is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs. We're delighted to be joined today by Ms. Meta Knudsen, the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General in the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, that is UNAMA. Ms. Knudsen will speak to us for about 20, 25 minutes, and uh, we will then go to a question and answer session. Both the formal presentation and the Q&A are on the record. Please feel free to send your questions in during the, during the formal presentation, and we will come to them later. You can do so by using the Q&A function on your screen. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag at IIEA, and we are also live streaming this event, so a very warm welcome to anybody joining us on uh, YouTube. It's now a great pleasure for me to formally introduce Ms. Meta Knudsen and to hand over to her. Meta Knudsen was appointed by the Secretary General as Deputy Special Representative Political for Afghanistan with UNAMA in January 1921. Uh, 2021, excuse me. Prior to her appointment, she served as Ambassador of Denmark to Afghanistan. She has held several senior positions with her foreign ministry, and she has been ambassador to Kenya, to Ethiopia, to Greece, and to Cyprus. Ms. Knudsen is a member of the Nordic Women Mediators. I hand the floor to you, Meta. Thank you very much, Ambassador Whelan, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, colleagues at the Institute of International and European Affairs for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, seminar, webinar. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to uh, be here with you to speak on the topic of Afghanistan and the role of the United Nations. We were afraid that Afghanistan would have slipped down the list of global priorities following the withdrawal of international troops in August last year and given events in, in Ukraine. But luckily, that has not been the case as demonstrated at the pledging conference last week where donors uh, gave um, uh, quite uh, an amazing uh, level of support for uh, Afghanistan. What happens in Afghanistan is also uh, still extremely relevant to global affairs. From the hard security concerns of global terrorism and regional stability, to important issues such as advancing a normative agenda that includes, includes especially the right of, rights of women and girls. We at UNAMA have had to grapple with these issues over the past seven months in ways that we had never anticipated. Politics by its nature must contend with dilemmas, but few dilemmas were as stark as those UNAMA faced in our August last year when the former government of Afghanistan dissolved and the country fell uh, to the Taliban. A non-recognized entity led by sanctioned individuals, they took over a country, brought economic systems to a standstill and challenged the international community with the dilemma of how to engage with unrecognized authorities to continue to support the Afghan people. In this situation, the United Nations took the decision to stay and deliver to support the people of Afghanistan. We knew that UNAMA had to stay, if only to continue to support humanitarian operations. And furthermore, the United Nations have been present in Afghanistan in some form or other since 1949. We knew we needed to remain in some form. The question that we did face was whether or not that form should be political. UNAMA is a special political mission and its continued presence created a number of secondary dilemmas. Could we engage pragmatically on issues of great potential impact to individual Afghans, such as, as human rights or rule of law, without unduly leg legitimizing a regime that had overturned a democratically elected government by force that had not first obtained the legitimacy from the Afghan people, and that had a history of gender discrimination and human rights abuses, as well as having, ha having used in this indiscriminate attacks as a tactic of war and killed thousands of civilians. 
and that had shown very few signs of reform or moderation uh, to the demands of the Afghan people. Obviously, in, in mid-August 2021, nobody knew how the Taliban's sudden accession to power would be translated into basic governance and what policy options the new leadership would adopt. Initial engagement with the de facto authorities was on the whole positive with fairly rapid protection offered uh, to UN premises and personnel and the proclamation of a general amnesty uh, to members and servants of the former Republic. There were high hopes at that time that after an initial spate of disorder and revenge uh, killings, uh, bad as that would be, the leadership would progressively assert control over its uh, disparate forces and enforce that promised amnesty. While many Afghans associated with the former republics succeeded in escaping, the, uh, the reality was that far more Afghans stayed behind to see what the new regime amounted to. And many civil society activists, academics and others sought UNAMA's assistance in playing a mediating role with the new authorities in the hope that a modus vivendi could be found. And an important element of our previous mandate committed us to supporting a government that no longer existed. And that mandate therefore to a large extent provided little guidance. The Security Council chose to defer a decision on a new mandate for UNAMA until last month. But what uh, the Secretary General proposed um, uh, some months ago to the Security Council as the basis for the new mandate was to begin political engagement with what the UN referred to as the de facto authorities, the Taliban regime, on several clearly defined terms. First of all, the engagement has as a primary objective the improvement of the lives of the Afghan people but it acknowledged the reality that this could not be achieved without some engagement with the de facto authorities. Secondly, while carrying out this qualified engagement, we had to be acutely conscious of the risk that our objective of supporting the Afghan people could be perceived as one of legitimizing the Taliban authorities and that this needed to be mitigated as the prerogative of recognizing a government, of course, rests uh, with our member states. And thirdly, the engagement was experimental. <clears throat> we based ourselves on the hypothesis that the Taliban was willing to move away from extremism and violence and towards actions and norms required to be a part of the international community. We knew <clears throat> that as we test this hypothesis, we need to keep our eyes open and to be able to change strategy if it appeared that this hypothesis was false. The Security Council, uh, to a large extent, gave UNAMA such a mandate suggested by the, and in line with what was suggested by the Secretary General. But it was only shortly thereafter that the Taliban took a number of the decisions that have forced us to seriously question the hypothesis I just mentioned. The most prominent of these uh, decisions was to prevent girls above grade six from going to school. While senior Taliban officials made public announcements that schools would reopen in the days running up to 23rd of March, the morning of the reopening of schools, the morning of the reopening of schools, girls were turned away from secondary schools, which remained closed for them. For months, the international community had signaled that this decision to allow girls to return to secondary education was a necessary step if the Taliban wished to gain international legitimacy. But the international community was by no means alone in wanting to see the Taliban enable all children return to school. According to Human Rights Watch, 87% of Afghans want their children to be educated regardless of gender. So the Taliban's decision does not reflect the, the wishes of the population that they claim to represent and govern. The denial of education not only violates the equal rights of women and girls to education, 
but also jeopardizes the country's future in view of the tremendous potential contributions of Afghan women and girls. The long-term impacts of such a discriminatory decision, discriminatory decision will affect future generations of Afghan females in terms of literacy and numeracy and will contribute to the cycle of poverty. <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, I visited public and private universities in Kabul as the public re universities recently opened their doors. Seeing women back in the park and in the halls of Kabul University really gave me some hope. But this optimism has been dashed by this announcement on girls' secondary education. If this decision is not reversed, soon there will not be any female students entering university, even if the universities would not be, be closed earlier by the de facto authorities, which still remains a risk. So this decision also led to condemnation by the international community, including the United Nations Security Council and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. But this decision on girls' education is not the only one which causes concern. In the days following the education decision, a slew of repressive measures from the de facto authorities were issued, which further restricted the civic space for Afghans. For example, they restricted Afghan women from traveling from Kabul International Airport without a mahram, a male chaperone. They instructed that public parks must be gender segregated by prescribed days. And they barred male civil servants from going to work if their beards were not sufficiently long. And this has been followed by a more recent instruction to the universities that women and men cannot attain, attend uh, the same scientific uh, conference or even participate in the same programs with all the concerns that that raises around academic freedom and, and general uh, keeping uh, the level of, of quality at the universities. Aside from these most recent additional restrictions, the overall situation for Afghan women and girls remains extremely challenging. Life for women without a maharam, for example, widow, widows or female-headed households, becomes almost impossible. With some exceptions, women continue to experience exclusion from civil service employment and access to justice and protection for survivors of gender-based violence remains extremely limited at best. The economic crisis has in the dire situations forced families to choose extreme coping mechanisms with stories emerging of those resorting to the sale of children or forced early marriage of girls. The media is becoming more and more restricted with the de facto authorities aiming to control content. Dissenting views continue to be silenced, including protests that counter the de facto authorities' narrative. Civil society activists and journalists are being arrested, beaten, and harassed. As someone put it, someone put it recently, a tweet could put your life at risk. With recently, the de facto authorities instructed Afghan media to suspend any transmission of international media broadcasts. It is thus very important that the international community continues to support the media and civil society, and especially also women-led organizations, so that they can continue to operate in Afghanistan. I would also mention that the once <clears throat> blooming Afghan culture of music, dance, and art is completely silenced. While some of the media still have women anchors, restrictions are placed on radio stations to invite women, women to their live shows. Live music is banned, radio music is limited to traditional or religious music, and the paintings on the walls within Kabul city which everybody who's visited Kabul will have noticed, they are now replaced by white walls. The color of the city is gone, as is the vibrant cultural life of Afghans. We also continue to document and verify credible reports of extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detention, enforced disappearances, torture, ill-treatment, and intimidation of a wide range of individuals, men and women. 
Victims of such violations include members of civil society, as well as those who fall under the provisions of the general amnesty announced by the Taliban when they came to power. They are former defense and security personnel, former government officials and civil servants. And additionally, UNAMA has also documented the killings of individuals accused of uh, affiliation with ISKP or DAIS. So what we try to stress to the de facto authorities is that they need to start taking a stronger position in preventing human rights violations and abuses. And where they do occur, they should undertake prompt, effective and transparent investigations. The de facto Ministry of Justice indicated that existing laws continue to apply pending their review of compliance with Sharia. A new court system has been set up by Taliban, but as to date, almost eight months after the takeover, there is a lack of clarity on which le legislation is being applied and instructions are being provided on an ad hoc basis. So the general lack of integration of former justice personnel in the current justice system and the absence of an inclusive engagement with communities on justice issues further undermines the, the, the legitimacy of the de facto authorities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Afghan people. Since the takeover by the Taliban, <clears throat> the state of governance remains ambiguous. For now, all power seems to be vested in the executive pillar. The cabinet is composed of 25 ministers with strong religious backgrounds and the vast majority being Pashtun and of course all are male and the appointments of subnational senior officials show similar trends. But what we have observed is that major decisions, however, seem not to be taken by the cabinet, but elsewhere in the Taliban structure. And their decision-making processes remain unclear in the absence of clearly defined mechanisms and systems of governance, such as um, a constitution. On the security side, while improvised explosive devices, assassinations, and Taliban house-to-house -house search operations continue, we, we should stress that a low level of security incidents have been reported in Afghanistan over the previous months. This should, of course, be analyzed in conjunction with the drastically changed security environment as hostilities throughout the country declined, uh, also leading to a, a sharp drop in, in civilian casualties, which of course is positive. While the Taliban continue to claim that the ISIS, ISKP are not a threat and are completely wiped up, out from Afghanistan, reports on the ground indicate otherwise as ISKP claimed or attributed attacks continue. And the Taliban also continue to face some attacks that are claimed by the National Resistance Front and other newly emerging resistance groups. And I should also mention that border tensions with neighboring countries uh, such as Pakistan, Iran, and the Central Asian countries uh, continue. And all of these developments are occurring within a dramatic economic and humanitarian situation, which definitely demand more attention from the de facto authorities. Afghanistan is facing a catastrophic humanitarian crisis, which uh, fundamentally also amounts to a human rights crisis, with over half of the country's approximately 40 million population needing humanitarian and protection assistance. In 2021, humanitarian partners delivered food, clean water, healthcare, and other humanitarian assistance to close to 20 million people in Afghanistan. And the pledging conference on 31st of March that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, co-hosted by the UN and member states, including governments of Qatar, the United Kingdom and Germany, resulted in pledges of more than $2 billion for humanitarian assistance. Quite an impressive figure uh, taking the present global situation into account. But we need to stress that humanitarian assistance alone is not enough. Other challenges to the economy, economy still remain. Uh, the economic situation is deteriorating quickly and challenges to international payments and on the central bank persist. The shortage of liquidity has forced businesses to close, including the ones uh, fledgling manufacturing se sector and left 80% of people in debt. 
In addition, development assistance has almost completely ceased since the takeover by the Taliban. From our side, from UNAMA, we have taken all possible measures to inject liquidity into the economy, including the physical import of cash. And also the international community has taken steps forward and considered options to increase engagement beyond humanitarian assistance to address the huge economic challenges. However, the recent restrictions announced by the Taliban question their claim to engage in good faith with the international community with the aim to improve the situation for all people of Afghanistan. While the Taliban faces a different society when, that when they last ruled the country, they may not be able to respond to the demands of this changed society. If the Taliban continue the path of repression and their inability to live up to the change from being an insurgency to a government, <clears throat> if they, they continue that inability, the Taliban risks that they will not gain legitimacy in the eyes of the Afghan people. Respecting human rights and inclusive governance, girls' education, and being a government for all people of Afghanistan would also be in the interest of the Taliban should they wish to stay in power. The jury is still out as to what direction they will turn, but the Taliban will have to make that choice before it is too late. The international community, including the neighbors and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, is united that the Taliban must deliver on three issues, girls' education, political inclusiveness, and counterterrorism guarantees. We sense that some Taliban interlocutors are willing to be attentive to international concerns on these issues, uh, especially actually on the education side where the criticism of this decision um, reaches far into the ranks of the Taliban. But unfortunately, there are also those within the Taliban that seem not to be willing to be attentive to these international concerns. We do not believe that we've seen the final uh, word on these issues, however. And in our political engagement, we have come to realize that the Taliban faces a number of dilemmas as well, related to the difficult process of transitioning from an ideological insurgency with a common outcome to a functioning government with multiple priorities and rising expectations. So we are only at the beginning of this process and uh, while we continue to engage, we, will, we are sure that uh, this process will continue to be frust frustrating. It will have setback, but it is also essential if we are to continue our support to the long-suffering Afghan people. So let me end my initial remarks here and uh, looking forward to the discussions and the questions. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Matt. That is... Um... It's quite a depressing picture. Um, if I could start off the, the questions by asking you, are there, are there any signs that um, the uh, present um, de, fact, de facto authority is uh, open to dialogue with others, um, either internally or externally? I know there was a meeting, I think, a week ago in Beijing with neighboring countries. Is there any indication that they're listening to messages that would uh, move forward on the three particular areas you identified. Our impression is, is definitely uh, that um, they are, uh, to some extent, willing to engage. Uh, we, we have had numerous interactions with uh, de facto ministers, with, with leaders within the Taliban, um, and we are also uh, aware that the, the de facto foreign minister Mutaki participated in the meetings in uh, China with the, the neighboring countries. Um, the challenge we see is uh, that it seems that the decision making um, is, is vested within um, circles that are not necessarily those that we have most engagement uh, with. Uh, so we are continuing to try and see if we can expand our uh, in the, the, the group of interlocutors and uh, getting a bigger, better access also to those um, uh, leaders of the Taliban that we might not have um, reached uh, so far. 
But again, as I had tried to, to say in, in my speech, I, I think that um, the most important influence is uh, the influence of the Afghan people and the, the fact that they on a, 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 a range of issues uh, are very clear that they, they are not happy with the present uh, policies of the Taliban. So for us to um, engage not only directly with the Taliban, but also in support of the Afghan people's possibilities of influencing the Taliban, I think is, is very important. Could I ask you just in that context, um, what is the status, what is the position of civil society at the moment in Afghanistan? You mentioned the pressure that's on the media. We have seen the protests um, of uh, Afghan women taken to the streets and, and uh, making their voices heard. Um, is it very difficult for them is the first question. And the second question that I have that's tied into that in part, how can Ireland, uh, how can we in Ireland, how can we support and assist um, the um, uh, safeguarding insofar as they can be safeguarded of the rights of the Afghan people? Thank you very much. Um, it's clear that the civil society is under a lot of pressure. Uh, there are, of course, uh, many of the more high-profile civil society leaders uh, that have uh, left Afghanistan uh, because of concerns for their safety. But there are also quite a lot of civil society activists, women activists, that are still here and still trying to, to, um, to keep up their activities, both in Kabul and out in the provinces. Um, in some areas, uh, they have managed to establish a dialogue with the authorities, sometimes facilitated also by our field offices. Uh, in other parts of the country, they are under a lot of pressure and, and it's, it's very difficult for them to, to operate. Um, I would say that the, um, uh, the, the picture is, is mixed. Um, it, it's only a few days ago where uh, there was a large civil society gathering here in uh, Kabul with uh, more than 280 uh, civil society representatives, both men and women present, and also representatives of the Taliban. We did not participate ourselves directly in this event, uh, but we understand that the, there was quite a good dialogue and there was a willingness uh, from the Taliban side uh, to listen. Uh, but that's only part of the picture. Of course, on the other side, we have seen the crackdown on uh, on women activists. Uh, we have um, uh, we are aware, of course, of, of threats and intimidation uh, directed uh, towards such activists. Um, so, so it it is definitely not an easy situation. I think, in terms of support brought for both from Ireland and others, uh, what we keep encouraging is uh, to. Um, for, for donors to, to try and uh, keep up some of their support that they were uh, available for civil society before the regime change. Uh, this is even more necessary now to, to continue to provide, especially also core funding for, for uh, civil society, for women's networks, um, for them to, 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 uh, to continue to keep activities going and also still be there when, when opportunities arise. Um, uh, so, so financial support is definitely important, uh, but, but of course also continued moral support, engagement, and making sure that we always bring uh, those civil society activists, women activists that are inside uh, Afghanistan, bring them also to the different forums, to the different tables uh, where they can make uh, their voices heard. Of course, with due respect for their security concerns, but, but that's one of the things that they continuously ask for. Please don't just listen to diaspora Afghans. Please let Afghans that are in the country have a voice. Uh, thank you. There's a question here from Adrian Farrell from the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in discussions with UNAMA, what do the Taliban think of the recently agreed UNAMA mandate? Um, and the sec another question I have here from Seamus Allen, um, talking about sanctions against Afghanistan, and he asked uh, for your views on US and Western sanctions, including the US freezing of Afghan central bank assets. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, when it comes to the mandate, uh, the uh, de facto authorities have welcomed uh, the new uh, UNAMA mandate uh, and have expressed their willingness to continue uh, to work with us. Um, but the extent to which that um, goodwill will uh, continue uh, is, of course, uh, probably linked to whether they see uh, the engagement with us and with the international community as uh, delivering some of the um, uh, objectives that they are pursuing. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, linked to, to the international recognition, to also removal of sanctions and so on. Um, and, and what we are expressing to them is that um, with decisions such as those on education, for example, they have taken a step backwards from uh, that pathway that could lead them towards, uh, at some point, uh, maybe uh, being recognized and um, being welcomed as a legitimate uh, part of the international uh, community. Um, uh, I mean, the sanctions... Um, uh, to a large extent are directed at, uh, at individuals and, and based on specific uh, concerns also related to um, uh, counter-terrorism and so on. Um, and, and that's, of course, for uh, to a large extent for member states to decide uh, when uh, they should be uh, lifted. Um, um, but where, where we have been engaging is mainly uh, on the uh, economic side trying to stress that the uh, sanctions against individuals should not mean that um, we are undermining uh, the whole of the Afghan economy to the uh, detriment of the Afghan people. So that's why we have also engaged so actively in terms of um, uh, seeing if we can resolve some of the issues around uh, the banking sector. Uh, this includes, of course, um, uh, close engagement with the, the US authorities um, and um, and we have had some uh, progress on that. And uh, although uh, there has been uh, recently a setback because of this education decision, but we are continuing the dialogue uh, both with the Afghan Central Bank um, and uh, the US authorities in terms of trying to find solutions that would allow um, uh, the Afghan banks to survive, it would allow liquidity to flow into Afghanistan and would allow the Afghan economy to, to um, uh, take, uh, to have benefits of the actually increased trade uh, that we have seen uh, since uh, August. Um, uh, I think that's worth noting that uh, again, of course, because of the improved security situation, uh, the fact that movements are uh, easier, we have seen um, an increase in um, trade across uh, the borders with neighboring countries. Uh, and it's really important that that can be further uh, supported to um, restart the Afghan economy. Uh, another question here from Damien Power uh, from the Defence Forces. Is there a sense that the Taliban are using the current uh, war in Ukraine as a cover to implement a more hardline approach within Afghanistan um, in the context that the Western world is very much engaged in that particular crisis? And then Peter McLoon, who is a board member of the IIEA, asks, uh, does META know what percentage of Afghans' income is now dependent on international development aid? And does this dependence provide any leverage in securing change? Um, thank you. Um, I don't think that we have made a direct link uh, between uh, the Ukrainian war and the um, the, the, the approach that the, um, the Taliban leaders are uh, taking at the moment. I think it's much more to do with some internal uh, dynamics uh, also uh, related to the, um, the power structure within uh, the Taliban and, and the um, needs uh, for some parts of the Taliban to, uh, to demonstrate more clear results uh, also to their internal followers. Uh, I think um, the war in Ukraine is, is, has more been of a concern to us uh, relating to the um, willingness to continue to, uh, for, for the international community to stay engaged in Afghanistan and to continue to provide the necessary humanitarian assistance. Uh, 
And as I said at the beginning, uh, so far um, we have been uh, encouraged by many statements also in the Security Council from member states clearly stressing that yes, Ukraine takes up a lot of bandwidth, but uh, the countries are committed uh, to um, assisting Afghanistan to be, keep the focus on Afghanistan. Um, I think what we uh, would um, be concerned with uh, in, in, in the midterm is of course uh, the general effects that we know that the, the war in Ukraine also have on um, uh, international food prices, for example, uh, which might of course also impact um, the, um, uh, the um, situation here in, in Afghanistan where a lot of the um, uh, wheat and other commodities are imported. Um, <laughs> How, what percentage of the population is dependent on development aid? Uh, that's actually zero, uh, because at the moment there is no development aid coming into uh, Afghanistan. Uh, but if, if the question was more uh, related to humanitarian assistance, uh, I would say that um, uh, at the moment it's about half the population that will depend on humanitarian assistance to cover just their most basic uh, needs. Um, so so uh, there's definitely uh, a, a strong dependence on humanitarian assistance and, and our message is if that is not to continue uh, year after year, then there is a need for the, um, for the donors, for the international community to find ways of also uh, supporting more long-term development objectives, even if it must at the outset be uh, through channels that uh, bypass uh, the government uh, structures. Um, at the recent um, uh, pledging conference, uh, there were donors uh, pledging also support for what we call basic human needs uh, that goes uh, somehow beyond the, the, the core humanitarian activities and where we hope we can uh, support more the preservation of the um, education system, the health system, uh, water uh, provisions and so on. Uh, but but at the moment it's it's very very limited. Um, that's for sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you. A few more questions here. One is from Alan Jukes, a former minister for finance in Ireland, and he asks about uh, the role of other Islamic states in uh, seeking to moderate excessively restrictive approaches to human rights and to the rights of women and girls. I think you touched on that slightly earlier uh, when you spoke about the organisation of Islamic states. But if you could give us a a, a bit more of a feel for, for the pressure they might be bringing to bear. And a question then from Francis Jacobs, a member of the Institute and a former head of the European Parliament representation in Ireland. And he asks about the attitude of non-Pashtuns non to the de, de facto authorities. Are there any efforts to reach out to them and what is happening in places that used to be controlled by the Northern Alliance? Can I just add on a slight codicil to that last question? Are there areas about which you have very little information, but which you have a lot of concerns in regard to the humanitarian situation? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, the role of other Islamic states, uh, I think this, this uh, can become very important. And uh, we have, uh, from the UNAMA side, uh, really tried to encourage also the engagement uh, of uh, other uh, Muslim majority or Islamic uh, countries in Afghanistan. We are really pleased with the engagement of the um, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, uh, uh, which also has a representation here in um, in Kabul uh, with an ambassador present and um, uh, one of the uh, initiatives they are looking at is to bring in a large group of um, Islamic scholars uh, after Ramadan uh, to, to have a dialogue with the um, de facto authorities uh, uh, on a number of these issues relating to um, to education, to women's rights and, and, and so on. Um, um, we see also countries such as, as Turkey, Qatar, uh, being very active, uh, also issuing statements around uh, the education decision, uh, and and in general being being very active in in uh, dialogue with the um, with the uh, authorities. We uh, we meet regularly with those uh, countries that still have representation here in uh, in Kabul, uh, which of course uh, are uh, most of the. Um, 
if not all of the uh, neighboring countries, um, Iran, Pakistan, uh, the Central Asian countries, we, we met with them just this morning and, uh, uh, and, and we find it very, very uh, important and useful uh, the, the, the way they try also to support uh, the um, objectives that we have in our engagement with the, um, with the, um, uh, the Taliban authorities. I think it's quite impressive uh, actually uh, the unity that have uh, been demonstrated across uh, all parts of the international community. Of course, there are different approaches and some are more interested in um, engaging more directly with, with the authorities than others. But in general, I think the messages that come uh, from uh, these countries and, and these different organizations uh, correspond uh, very much with also what is coming, for example, from the Security Council. Um, <clears throat> As, as I mentioned uh, uh, regarding the, the Pashtun, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the current authorities, uh, governments, uh, and so on structure are um, to a very, very high extent uh, dominated by uh, Pashtuns. Uh, and that, of course, um, causes a lot of concern amongst other ethnic groups that do feel um, alienated and uh, re removed from any influence uh, on uh, the government. And, and we also see that in some areas of Afghanistan where uh, there are also non-Pashtun Taliban, uh, there are increasing the tensions uh, between um, Pashtun and non-Pashtun Taliban, especially in the north. Um, and it's, it's, it's a clear message from us to, to the de facto authorities that longer term stability and development in Afghanistan will depend on uh, providing uh, possibilities for other ethnic groups uh, to uh, influence uh, government to feel represented. Um, at the moment, unfortunately, we do not see any attempt from the Taliban side, from the de facto authorities, to engage in such an outreach to other, uh, other ethnic uh, groups. Um, uh, and and it's, it's, it, it has not yet uh, been having much uh, traction. Uh, the, the call has also come from former President uh, Karzai, for example, uh, and, and has largely been, been, been ignored. Um, probably also reflecting the fact that, uh, that internally in the Taliban, they are still also balancing um, their own uh, sort of um, division of power between different um, also Pashtun uh, groups. Uh, on the humanitarian situation, um, uh, of, of course, I'm not directly responsible for that, uh, so I, I don't have all the details, but I would say that um, in general, we have access now um, to almost all districts in the country, uh, contrary to what has been the case for decades uh, with the improved security. Um, uh, the UN and its partners, international NGOs, national NGOs, we to, together we do actually access almost all districts in the country. So I think the um, the uh, the overview and and uh, the um, knowledge on on the humanitarian situation is uh, by now quite good. Uh, and of course also. Um, it's, it's clear that they're, they're, some of these areas that have been very difficult to reach before are in a very dire situation. Uh, they were already uh, in a difficult situation before uh, August. Uh, we have the prolonged uh, droughts uh, here, slightly more rain this winter, but still not enough to, to really um, uh, uh, cover all the needs uh, in the agricultural sector. Um, uh, of course, the, the fact that the services have not been reaching uh, these parts of the country for a long time, uh, the situation is really difficult, but, but the good thing is that we do now uh, have uh, access uh, in a way that we did not have before. Um, thank you for that, Meta. Um, two more questions, and, and we're probably coming towards the end of the question, so if anyone has uh, anything outstanding, please get it to us um, shortly. This one is from Sarah Bracken um, in the IIEA. Is there, um, perhaps you could talk about the requirement to have a Maram um, present with a woman when she is seeking medical assistance. Um, is that being strictly in, enforced? And um, um, is that a, a new step uh, or was that already the case in their previous uh, iteration? Um, 
Then there's a question from Kevin Culligan from the Department of Foreign Affairs. To what extent are the Taliban aware of the difficulties um, in the delivery of humanitarian assistance uh, posed by the new restrictions on women's freedom of movement? Uh, on the Mahram issue, um, <clears throat> I would say our impression is uh, on this issues, as on, on many other issues, the uh, implementation of the different uh, directives are quite unequal, uh, unequal across uh, the country. In some areas, uh, we see very strict uh, strict implementation of some of these demands, uh, both on, on, I mean, uh, dress code uh, for women, uh, whether women can move without a maharam, whether they can access uh, medical uh, assistance, but in other parts of the country, they, they are not uh, such uh, um, uh, uh, big issues. Uh, it's not so 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 difficult. And uh, I mean, I've, I've visited a number of, of provinces uh, lately and um, I mean, for example, in, in, in Bamiyan, you, you still see uh, quite a lot of women moving in the streets without being uh, sort of too covered up. Uh, there is, a, um, there is um, a part of the market uh, with uh, shops run by women uh, selling handicraft that's still open. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, in, in Kabul, I would say the, 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 uh, the image in the streets is uh, slowly changing. I mean, there are not many women, but there are still women, but they are increasingly um, uh, very uh, conservatively uh, uh, dressed. Um, uh, and I, I think the, um, the, the, the fact that the population do not really know when uh, and how these um, uh, directives will be implemented. Uh, it creates a lot of, of fear and uncertainty and, and many choose to sort of maybe over comply because they don't know uh, what, uh, what uh, response they would be met with. Um, so, so, uh, so again, I mean, it differs uh, across the country, but, uh, but I think the trend at the moment is towards more and more uh, restrictions and, and, and more and more difficulties um, for the women. Um, I mentioned before that I had uh, visited the uh, Kabul University some weeks ago, which was a very positive experience. Uh, lots of uh, female students around. I had a dialogue both with female and male students and also with female uh, faculty, male faculty. Uh, the female students dressed sort of still quite lively. Um, when I passed the university just two days ago, all the female students that were lined up outside to get into the university were dressed in black from top to toe and um, definitely not allowed anymore to get into the university unless they, uh, they abide by this dress code. Uh, I mean, just a sign that, that at the moment the thing, things are not going in the right direction. They are going towards more restrictions, more uh, rules being uh, imposed on, especially on the women, but also uh, on the men, as I mentioned, um, the rules around uh, growing beards and, and uh, also dress code if you want to enter ministries or public offices. Um, um, Sorry, I think I can't think you... my own notes on the last question. <laughs> it was something about the humanitarian assistance. Um, yes, um, there was a question, to what extent are the de facto authorities aware that their, um, their new restrictions on women's freedom of movement are impacting on the delivery of uh, humanitarian assistance? Well, it's 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 definitely something that is is discussed with them, but to to what extent they accept uh, this is a, is another issue. Um, I mean, um, uh, again, lately from some of the meetings I've had with the provincial governors, um, uh, you you often get the argument that uh, within uh, their interpretation of of Islam and Sharia, it's very important to protect women and women are best protected if they stay uh, in their homes and it's the duty of the men to take care of them. Uh, and that is uh, the logic they are coming from. So, so, um, so I, I'm not sure that it always makes a, 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 an, an impression on them that you try and discuss the need to have 
uh, women having um, easy access to humanitarian assistance and also the need to have women uh, part of uh, the delivery of uh, not only humanitarian assistance, but, but also another area we, we raise with them is uh, women's access to justice, uh, and especially also for women uh, that are victims of, of gender-based violence, that they, they need to be able to interact with uh, the with, uh, female officials, police uh, men, um, uh, uh, female uh, staff in the, the, the legal sector and so on. Um, and, and they do uh, respond to some extent. I mean, there are in most places, there are women back in the police force, for example. Uh, but in other areas, it's, it's not easy to, to, uh, to get um, them to accept that this is, this is necessary. Another question here from Arif Sahil. He says that UNAMA's new mandate gives stronger focus on facilitating dialogue amongst political stakeholders for inclusive governance. Um, there is a there is broad recognition on the need to reach a comprehensive agreement between Taliban and other political groups. What measures might you be contemplating in that regard um, that could lead to national agreement, as was called for in Security Council Resolution 2513? And then em Emily Binchy asks, do you have any remarks regarding the role of Qatar in the in efforts um, in, in sorry, in international efforts and dialogue with the Taliban. I think you mentioned them there in the context of Islamic states. Um, could I add, add in another question there? Um, how should we interpret the Taliban uh, decision to crack down on poppy production? Is that a response to international pressure or is that an effort to find, uh, to find international recognition? Uh, um... The, the, uh, the part of our new mandate uh, that um, talks about uh, our role in trying to pro promote uh, broad-based dialogue on inclusive governance, on representativity, on, uh, uh, on, uh, in, um, on um, uh, all groups in society being able to, to take part in, 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 in governance, uh, is, a, is a really important part of the mandate and one that we had um, really hoped uh, that we would get so, strong backing uh, from the Security Council for, uh, because that is, uh, I, I, I mean, we see that as the <clears throat> key issue for long-term stability and also creating the possibility of, of uh, sustainable development in Afghanistan if we can achieve that kind of um, <clears throat> discussion where, where uh, broader parts of the population are included. Um, so, so the idea from our side is, is definitely to, to, to um, work on these issues, both at the, the, the national level, but definitely also through our field offices at, uh, at the provincial level, where, where we sometimes see more possibilities of, of furthering this dialogue. I think there is a, a strong need here for also a bottom-up approach to um, um, uh, dialogues around uh, inclusion, but also uh, conflict management, reconciliation, and so on. Um, the problem, of course, at the moment is that uh, with the um, decisions on, on education and some of these restrictive measures we have seen lately, um, that calls into question uh, whether uh, our strategy of, of of, uh, uh, or our hypothesis that we could uh, make uh, progress on, on um, promoting such types of dialogue, whether that is actually possible. Um, uh, and as I said, the jury is still out. Uh, we will continue uh, to try and, and um, create for us where this is possible. We will continue to impress upon the, 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 the Taliban authorities that it's also in their interest uh, to uh, open up to wider parts of society. Uh, but whether we will succeed, I think, um, is something that, um, that we will still uh, have to wait some time to, to see. Um, and again, as I said, uh, I think the strength is very much in uh, the demands also from the Afghan population. Um, that re do really want uh, to be uh, heard and to have uh, their um, interests reflected also in, in what the, the government decides. 
so, so again, it's also very much about engaging with uh, Afghan society and trying to support these organizations, networks, whatever that still uh, exists um, in, in the country. And as I said, I think the region uh, and also other Muslim countries can play an important role here. And, and definitely Qatar is one of the countries that have played an active and positive role. We've also been really happy with the um, UAE, uh, who has a strong voice also in the Security Council, uh, and uh, um, who helped uh, uh, a lot uh, around uh, the adoption of our mandate. Uh, and uh, um, uh, that country is also participating quite actively in the dialogue we have uh, with the region uh, here in country. Um, the ban on puppy production and the dog drug trade, um, I think it took uh, us all a bit by surprise, uh, that decision. Uh, in many ways, of course, it's, it's welcome. It's what uh, the uh, international community uh, and also the neighbors have asked for, for for years, that there should be a more efficient attempt to control uh, um, this um, sector in Afghanistan. Um, but um, <clears throat> what we are saying is that uh, we um, would uh, be very interested in, in seeing also plans for how this uh, decision is, is to be implemented. Uh, at the outset, we, there are some concerns uh, that um, uh, if, if a ban on, uh, for example, the ongoing harvest were to come into play right away, it would completely destroy the livelihood for, for large parts of, um, uh, especially uh, farmers in the southern part of the country who would not be able in the short, um, in, in the short term to replace the poppies with other uh, crops. Um, so for this not to lead to further economic uh, hardship, further disaster for an already very vulnerable part of the population, it would need to be a, a decision that would have to be implemented gradually and accompanied by measures that can address um, the, um, the economic needs of, of these parts of the, pro uh, the population. And then there are, of course, a whole host uh, of other um, uh, challenges involved in, in, in controlling the trade, uh, the uh, smuggling, the export, and so on. Um, we are still studying um, uh, this uh, decision and this, uh, hope to have further discussions with the Taliban authorities on, on what their plans are. Um, uh, what led to the discussion coming right now, um, I think it, it becomes a bit a uh, question of speculation. Uh, I mean, it, it, it might... It might be linked to, to diverting attention away from the education side, but it might also be something that has been brewing within the Taliban for a while. Uh, and now they just uh, found that this was the right time to, to, to come forward with the decision. Uh, so I don't think we can say exactly what, what led to this. <clears throat> well, thank you very, very much, Meta. Um, um, I'm hugely impressed by the work that UNAMA is doing in Kabul. I'm hugely impressed by the fact that you are living in Kabul and that we are able to benefit from your expertise today. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best um, and UNAMA all the best with its mandate. Thank you very much. And uh, it was really a pleasure to participate and, and be part of this discussion also. And uh, uh, please, uh, I mean, if anybody wants to continue with uh, some questions, we are, we are always available uh, here in Kabul. Thank you very much.